Bozidar, thank you for joining me here in San Francisco. So tell me a bit about your background and your current focus at Sanofi. Thanks for having me, first of all. Um, I, I lead the digital therapeutics group at Sanofi, joined about two and a half years ago. Um, and uh, the focus is really leading the strategy when it comes to digital therapeutics, all the thinking behind it, um, as well as finding the right partners to do it, as well as doing some early proof of concept kind of studies before we decide whether you know we should build something or partner with someone else or, or anything like that. So. And how do you define digital therapeutics? Because the term's used a lot, but I think it means mm. different things to different people. Yeah, I, I feel like everyone has their own definition. Um, the way we define it is that there are, those are non-pharmacological, mostly tech-based uh, interventions that either combined with drugs or a standalone can do two things, uh, improve patient outcomes and drive business impact. And it's important that any solution that we think of developing both improve out improves outcomes and drives business impact. Because if it does only one, uh, let's say, drive business impact, it becomes too commercial, too mar becomes like a marketing tool and it doesn't deliver the outcomes. If it's only focused on the outcomes, it becomes like, to be too medical, doesn't get enough support from all the functions. So it's important that it does both um, and it can be standalone on its own, which is now becoming the thing lately, or combined with drugs, which is more what used to be or still called the digital companions, but uh, can lead to some interesting developments in the future. Different way. So it doesn't have to stand alongside a specific drug. It could be a standalone digital therapeutic that you would get involved yeah. in. Yeah. And that, that is, I think, the biggest, one of the biggest leaps in the thinking uh, that we had to go through. And myself as being an ambassador of digital therapeutic, as an evangelist internally, uh, working with our executives, because we as a healthcare life science pharma company, we sell uh, physical stuff vaccines, products, consumer business, etc. But it's physical stuff, we're not selling digital. And usually when you think anything digital, we are looking at things related to our therapeutic areas. And Sanofi is very diverse when it comes to that. But still, um, with standalone uh, digital therapeutics, we are not confined there. What we can go for, like with Happy Five, we're focusing on mental health uh, with a deal and anxiety, depression, fatigue um, in multiple sclerosis and we currently don't really have branded uh, products in mental health or fatigue. So that's just an example of of like two, I would say, maybe even I call it a radical shifts in thinking. One, going for standalone. So maybe in the future selling something that is not a drug or vaccine or OTC. And second, doing it in a therapeutic area where we currently have no products. So. It's pretty big if you think about it. Yeah. And you mentioned there your collaboration with Happify and Multiple Sclerosis, obviously announced last year. What were the key criteria that made you want to partner with Happify? What was it they presented? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's interesting to say, like last year, uh, it seems like yeah. we're in January, you know, it feels like last it, year, exactly. but it is last yeah. year. And interestingly, um, it was last year at this conference where. Um, where Happify and Sanofi got to know each other better uh, and signed a deal about June, I think it was announced later. One of the key aspects of my job, I'm a big believer in partnering uh, with startups, right? You can build, you can buy, you can partner, right? So I'm a big believer because partnering enables um, us and startups to, to bring the best out of both worlds. Because we can also bring the worst out of both worlds. We can be like a big company bureaucracy and we can live some messiness that go messiness, quote unquote, to go with stars. But we can bring mm, rigor in thinking and scale when it comes to commercial channels, when it comes to market access, when it comes to clinical development, etc. cetera, um, of a large company coupled with agility and experience in product development for digital products, a smaller company and engagement, which we don't have as a big farm. So since I'm personally a big believer in that, I think that's the right model, uh, similar to like pharma biotech kind of model. Um, then the, one of the key aspects of my job is to make sure that um, my team and I are able to identify the right partners. 
Okay. So Happy Pie we met, for example, two years ago, just to give a little bit of background. It was, um, it was driven by our multiple sclerosis folks who were looking for different startups for different beyond the pill needs that exist. Happy Fi came about, one of them was mental health and fatigue, um, which is experienced by 60% plus of the MS patients. So it's a real problem that is not addressed by uh, MS drugs, um, disease modifying uh, agents. And so we met them and then we started to get to know each other better. Um, but in order to be able to work with a company like Sanofi, there's a certain level of maturity that startup needs to have. Like whether we want it or not, like I love startups, but I also do know that to get to the level working with a large pharma, there needs to be there needs to be certain list that, things on the list that are checked off. For example, there needs to be a pretty solid evidence that the product works, right? And you know, ideally one or more uh, clinical trials. There needs to be pretty strong evidence that product is engaging, right? Uh, there needs to be a pretty strong team in the place with the right mix of, you know, healthcare, business, technology, and engagement, dig digital products. Uh, there needs to be also certain chemistry between the teams. I mean, that's also important. And then after that, we start to see, you know, whether our philosophy, each other philosophy works, right? And whether we think of the future, the digital therapeutics, what does that future 10 years from now look like when it comes to day-to-day -day HCP practice, right? And so we had to do exactly like that, we went through those processes. Um, to give you a little bit more information, I was, for example, impressed with, with the amount of users that they had, the amount the engagement that they had. Um, background of Happyfy co-founders is in video gaming, so they do understand how to create sticky experiences, but this is applied to health. Um, and then positive, and then anxiety, depression, and mental health, I think is one of the most neglected areas that can be tackled so well with digital uh, products. There's not too much innovation on the, on the drug side for many years. And so mental health is, is a problem. And another thing that it really excited me about that whole area is that mental health, we started calling it the meta condition. So if you look at, all the chronic diseases right now that are putting pressure on healthcare system and of course that a lot of patients are experiencing, 50% or more of those chronic diseases, be it diabetes or skin diseases or um, you know, post-myocardial infarction patients or heart diseases or respiratory diseases, 50% or more patients will have some level of anxiety and depression right. diagnosed. So it's a meta condition, which if you think about it, it's a no-brainer. Mind and body are connected. You know, if you're not doing well here, so how can we work on someone's like mental health at the same time, make them more engaged and motivated to work on their physical health? So it's quite exciting because it spans across different conditions. There, there are so many opportunities. So anyway, I could talk about it for hours, but no, it's, no. it sounds really yeah. exciting. And, it, and what you're saying is very logical. If, if you improve the mental health, the overall patient condition will be better. But talk to me a bit about the kind of payer landscape and the outcome side, because you've mentioned they need the evidence that it works. How does that translate to kind of cost effectiveness, which seems to be a big focus for digital therapeutics now? Well, that's a great question. Um, um, if I think of the reasons to believe in digital therapeutics, right, there's there are like these big assumptions questions, big assumptions that we need to continuously validate. And five, six years ago it was, will patients engage with this product, right? Or they don't want to engage with the health. We talk about engagement, they want to disengage from it. Now we know that we know how to do engage, how to deliver engagement. Second question is, do these solutions deliver outcomes? There is their evidence. And now we know that, you know, in, in, in for many, there have many studies already that many of these solutions they were Then we start to get to the question of market access and commercial channels. To your question, market access. Who is going to pay for this, right? Right now there are multiple models. I think the two dominant ones are the one where through employers uh, and directly to payers, 
uh, where company, even Happy Fight has that model for a few years, companies like Chizumata um, and others have been successfully deploying Hangli Bongo, is another example. And you have this prescription model that, is, um, that has a promise for the future uh, that we are exploring as well. Um, if I look at the prescription model, that's the one that uh, I am excited about and curious to see how it will develop. No one knows. But what I'm sensing in all the conversations, you know, with multiple stakeholders in the ecosystem, that payers are open and skeptical. Like, I don't think that payers insurance companies are going, you know, people who work there go to bed thinking about digital therapeutics and waiting for the launches of the products. No, but they're open to the idea of something that uh, works across population, not in three to 5% of the patients, like across the population, that's the hard part, and that is cost effective. So we show evidence of, of these two things. The pairs, I would say, halfway through. And I think there is a last piece, which is a commercial, which is how do we monetize these solutions? Uh, and, you know, I still believe that we show the value in terms of outcomes. There's no reason why you're not able to price for that. Now, who's going to pay, whether it's more employer model and payer model where the results get results faster, but you cannot get to the size and scale that you could do if it's a prescription or you go prescription, which is likely a slower route, route with more protection versus competitors, but also potential to have really big products in space. Yeah. You don't know. So I think those are open questions. Everything in healthcare, I, someone told me like last year, everything takes, uh, if you think it takes a year, it will take three years. So we'll see. Those two things will take. And building on that point, there is a school of thought where people have said that in the future, every medicine will be a digital medicine and there'll be a digital therapeutic component and a medicine component. Do you think we will get to that point? Mm -hmm. and, and, and if so, will it be pharma that's being asked to commission those services? Uh, or yeah. providing those services? Yeah. Mm. First of all, I'm convinced that uh, we are moving into the future where prescribing a physical product followed by prescribing a digital product is, is reality. I mean, it's a question of time when doctor will do one and the other or sure. together. Um, and the reason why I believe in that is simply because of the statistics. More than 80% of diseases that put that are 80% of the cost of the healthcare system in the US, for example, and this is similar to other countries, uh, come from the chronic non uh, communicable or non infectious diseases that can be modified or reversed by behavior change. Yeah. Modified or reversed by behavior change, not by drugs, right? So we're talking diabetes talking about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, we're talking about uh, high lipids, cholesterol, uh, hyperepidemia, um, hypertension and depression, I think top five. So why are people not changing their behavior? Uh, because it's one of the hardest things on the planet, but we now know that we can do that uh, with these tools. So the costs are becoming so big for the system and yet everyone has a smartphone in their pockets and we know how to drive engagement right now we meaning digital therapeutics world that it's inevitable that that will happen right so that's why i'm a big believer that that future is coming and the practice of medicine will be shaped by that for pharma it's a great opportunity to further differentiate to think more holistically um pharma has certain advantages like it has scale it has rigor in clinical regulatory um thinking and, and um, understand, understands the healthcare and the whole ecosystem. Um, but I'm sure there will be uh, insurers, payers can play a major role in that. Uh, I'm sure there will be some new kids on the block. That we have no clue. I'm sure the tech companies are all jumping on this opportunity. So there's going to be a lot of competition. Yeah. But pharma, opportunity to really engage in precision medicine. Just a few more quick things then. Um, Exciting year last year for Sanofi, new chief exec coming in with Paul Hudson. I guess it's still early days, but do you see signs of renewed focus on digital health and digital medicines with that new leadership? Yes, yeah, so great question. Uh, I don't have full answer to that. Uh, Paul joined, uh, I think about four months ago, 
and um, he went on what he called a listening tour of multiple countries um, and uh, for about three months and then announced pretty big changes on 10th of December at the Capital Markets Day. Um, if you look at those announcements, uh, a lot of the focus was on core pharma business and the pipeline and playing to be, you know, number one or number two in the markets. So I think um, that is probably for this early days going to be a pretty big focus of his. Um, but as uh, you know, and a lot of people who, who, who know him from public statements, and I used to work at Novartis in the past uh, while he was there for about a year, um, he's also a big believer in digital. So, and he also like, publishes often on that. So the key question is what part of digital will be focused? Um, whether it will be more uh, there was, you know, clinical trials in AI and everything we do with drug discovery and research, whether it be digital therapeutics, or my guess it would be different aspects. We cannot pick and choose. But I think over the next six months we'll get more clarity and there'll be more public announcements of, on what's coming. But for now, a lot of focus is on core business. And if you had to give a key bit of advice to digital health companies that want to partner with Sanofi, what would it be? So that's always a hard one. But um, the first one is that, as I said, that companies need to be at a certain level of maturity um, and have a certain level of evidence that the product works. Um, they also shouldn't underestimate themselves. In other words, they should be very targeted in what pharma companies they are going after. You know that I think seven chief digital officers have been appointed over the past two years. So you probably get more likely traction in a company that just appointed the CDO or just hire a lot of digital people. So kind of be really smart about targeting. Don't go, you know, spray and pray approach. Um, the third thing is that is to spend time understanding who can be your internal champion. Like that's the mobilizer, I call it. In the digital therapeutics, that's me in Sano at Sanofi because I'm the first one who needs to believe in that in order to evangelize it internally. So really try to understand who can be your internal champion. The process is long and tedious. <laughs> and then the fourth piece is try to inject in a real way some sense of urgency because large companies don't move that fast. But the easiest way is to work with several pharma, like two within the therapeutic area and say, hey, I'm talking to these guys they're interested or we're not, not, we're not revealed, but you can talk with another pharma company for this same therapeutic area. And that always moves uh, big pharma a little bit. Of course, yeah. it has to be real, um, and I, but I've seen it work. Yeah. So those will be the four pieces of advice. Great, thank you. And my last question, and this is a tough one because there's so much happening. There is so much happening in digital health at the moment, so many technologies. Is there one particular area or technology that really excites you and you think will be a game changer in health? That is really a tough one. Sorry. Um, <laughs> digital health has become so broad that uh, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I already said a digital therapeutic and mental health is one area that I'm extremely excited in behavior change, but that's right up my alley right now. Um, the promise of drug discovery through understanding better the molecular targets and the patterns that are happening within the cell, what they call single cell right now, super exciting. So that's one area where I don't know too much about, but whenever I get to go deeper and talk with people, I'm like, huh, this is, if, if this happens, so finding like targets like PD-1 that just created the biggest pharmaceutical product in the whole industry, k true of the future, finding more targets like that faster that, that is just, you know, incredible if we're able to get there, so. Paul Zidar, thanks very much for speaking with me. It's been great. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure.